Welcome everybody. So today we continue our series of lectures, Adventures Through the Laws of Nature. We have uh, Dmitro Volin that uh, will speak about quantum field theory. Hello everyone. You can hear me well? Yeah, good. Today we uh, finally go beyond what is usually discussed on forums about quantum mechanics and do a little bit closer to modern times. Um, but yet we still have to go to the past first. We start uh, by asking uh, Google, what is the biggest machine built by human? And Google actually tells us, will tell us, I checked it, that Walt Guinness said it is LHC, Large Hadronic Collider. And I kind of can agree with this uh, completely uh, because it's really very huge machine. Uh, here uh, you can see uh, some part of it. It's quite a small part of it, actually. Uh, this is uh, a CMS detector, one of the several detectors that in a large hadronic collider. And here you can see a human. So most of this actually, uh, is, uh, if I understand correctly, are detectors that will de uh, detect different particles and metallic stuff uh, like here, uh, some uh, electronic equipment which collect da data. And there are some wires which will bring data to computer. Roughly it's like this. But it just uh, a detector which will uh, detect what happening uh, In, in, in this small tube here, if you can see. The real thing is accelerator itself, and it's much bigger. So uh, our detector, which we discussed was here. It's a big uh, building inside of which we have the detector. And uh, the machine itself is 27 kilometers in circumference. Uh, it actually doesn't fit in well. It, it's uh, partially in France, uh, most of it, and uh, some part of it is in, in Switzerland. Uh, it's uh, situated close to the Geneva uh, city. And, uh, yeah, and in diameter is 8.5 kilometers. Uh, in the very first lecture, we have been discussing scales. And I remind you that uh, uh, this pixel here actually is a little bit less than pixel is the size of a human. And then if it's size of a human, this will be size of two kilometers wide. Now, if you make two kilometers wide uh, uh, on the real map, it will be size of Gambia Stam in Stockholm. And then uh, up to scale, we put a big ring of accelerator of LHC. It will be roughly corresponding. Uh, it's actually interesting because it's uh, quite well fits E20 uh, uh, highway, which uh, goes around Stockholm. So this is how big the machine is. Uh, it uh, took uh, 10 years to build it. There are about 10,000 scientists working and more than 100 countries participate uh, in contributing uh, money to, uh, for its operation. Its budget is almost 5 billion, uh, not, not budget, but cost of, of, of construction was 5 billion uh, American dollars roughly. And every year budget is about $1 billion. It can be compared to the budget of Paris, which is 8 billion uh, last, last year. It has very many uh, superconducting wires in it. And actually it's uh, 250,000 kilometers. Well, you can see it's seven times around the equator. And this is not just wires, it's superconducting wires. I imagine nothing else was uh, uh, required to that many wires. That's how many, you also see how many data. Um, you also see how many, much data it, it uh, accumulates. It's 30 petabytes of data per year. And reality, actually, all the detectors produce information, which is one petabyte per second. It's just uh, too much to store, and they throw away most of it and keep only a little bit. Still, it's accumulated with 30 petabytes per year. And uh, energy consumption is one fifth of general consumption, and it's uh, average over year when it's operating, it's actually quite high. Uh, so, this is uh, how big it is. And 
what it is for to 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 study these crazy pictures, which nobody uh, like meaningfully understand what's going on. It requires analysis. And finally, I want to notice that this uh, this machine was built for the sole purpose of nature exploration. It has no immediate industrial application, maybe in future, uh, but not now. So it's a huge thing, and the question that you try to understand, how did humanity reach the stage of building such a monster? I decided to go back uh, more than 100 years to the year 1905. Uh, in the year 1905, I found several pictures of Stockholm. Uh, so I understand this is royal palace. Uh, and the, so there are some horses, uh, pulling carriages. You see actually here some rails. So first I think, okay, a tramway was there, but in reality, tramways was pulled by horses. Uh, although on the, on the picture it was said that it's the last tramway pulled by horses. After that, they actually changed and made it electric or maybe steam power, I mean, uh, diesel power. And there were already cars, and the, in, in restaurants, people were wearing all these nice dresses, not like we are today. It was much was more elegant. But this already was a buffet. It was not uh, like served food. So this is how uh, life looked like uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, starting to become a little bit familiar to a modern line, but, but still quite different. Uh, but also, I want to to notice that now it's about 50 years that industrial revolution have happened. And this means that the production by humanity changed completely how it's done. And scientists in particular uh, got access to completely new type of technologies. And this led to many different discoveries. Let us see uh, what happens pre-1905, recent uh, few years, like a maximum 20, 25 years before. Uh, so cinematography was discovered about 20 years before, and 1905 was the year when they started to film inside the doors without the usage of uh, sunlight. So they completely uh, changed the level of exposure they required. This is 1906, I don't know what this appears, six, but first cartoon was made in 1906. Uh, uh, I'll show you horses, but in reality, people already knew electricity very well, and London some way, uh, uh, started to operate uh, electric locomotives in 1890, 15 years between, uh, before 1905. Diesel engine, the one which is used in cars uh, these days, uh, started operating in 1893. Uh, Brothers Wright uh, uh, launched uh, first controlled powered uh, heavier than year uh, flight. And I want to notice that uh, mathematics behind the fact that uh, airplane can fly was known for more than 100 years. People just concluded that we do not have technology for designing powerful and uh, enough and uh, light enough engines. So we have to wait. And so the time came and special engine was designed. Uh, but anyway, Brother Size did not claim they designed a good engine. What they did, they designed a good control system to control the flight. This was the, the, the real contribution to the flight. Anyway, this happened roughly the same time we're speaking about. We have a radio already uh, patented. There are many radios style before Marconi, but uh, this is when it was patent become popular. Uh, in, in physics, electron was discovered not so long time ago, and Nobel Prize started running in 1901. So uh, actually, Röntgen uh, discovered uh, X-rays in 1896, and 1901 is just the first Nobel Prize, uh, prize that was awarded. Uh, so this is roughly the year when uh, New Epoch started, and uh, we have most of the discoveries that become more and more uh, well designed with future, but the ideas and principles of action was well already there. If you look on these years, I could have chosen maybe uh, last 20 years of the 19th century, but I chose this year for a very specific reason, because uh, uh, in this year, uh, it's called Miraculous Year, uh, when Albert Einstein published not one, but four papers. And uh, let us make a quiz. Uh, so there are actually four formulas. When I was reviewing my slide, I realized I actually made some mistakes. The square root is not here, uh, but otherwise it's okay. Uh, and uh, so let's play a game. 
can you tell which formula corresponds to which paper? So first paper, it's called on the heuristic viewpoint concerning the production and transformation of light. Which formula goes there? This one. Yeah, so this is actually the paper uh, for which Einstein was awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. It's about explanation of photoelectric effect when he used the Planck idea uh, that energy is transferred in quantum proportion equal to Planck constant time frequency of light. Uh, so each new goes here. Let's go to the next one. On the motion of small particles suspended in a stationary liquid as required by the molecular kinetic theory of heat. That's a very complicated title. The third one, yes. So this is Brownian motion. So he could just write on Brownian motion and it will be clear. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, didn't they have this courses like efficient paper publication that we like have these days? Um, and then the third one on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Uh, Sasha did the lecture on special relativity list. <laughs> so it's sequel to constant. So the paper when Einstein postulated that C in constant is there, uh, the one of the laws of nature, and it follows from Maxwell equations in particular. In this, for, in this paper, we also have addition of velocities formula. I wanted to write it, but then so no, it's, it's kind of too, 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 much, too long formula. So let's, let's pick it up. And finally, the last one, does the inertia of a body depend upon its energy content? Content. Well, this is famous E equals MC square, but as we learned last time, this formula was not written there in reality. It was equal delta E equal delta MC square, roughly. Uh, and uh, and also, uh, all these four formulas are very, import very important formulas for modern science, uh, but don't think that Einstein invented everything. There were quite a few papers before him, uh, which contained a lot of very useful ideas. And uh, we, we can debate whether he was actually the first to, to write this. I will not debate it today, but notice, uh, I'm not very good at history of science, but I'm doing science myself. It's not like one person sits down, thinks, and discovers. Uh, process is much more complex. It takes many years, and a lot of people in community co contribute these different ideas, and somehow it evolves. Eventually, phase transition happens, and suddenly we understand. And the person who actually happened to be on the specification, yeah, he gets the credit. But there are very many people around just before, just after, who contribute really important uh, knowledge. And if you look in the papers around these years, all these ideas uh, were present in many papers. This forum existed for electromagnetic radiation before Einstein. Uh, the the, the equal to constant false follow was uh, related to electromagnetic electromagnetism. And for instance, you know what is this something is called Lorentz contraction. It's not called Einstein contraction, it's called Lorentz contraction. For the reason that Lorentz knew it before Einstein. Um, and so on. Uh, this formula, I, I checked Wikipedia before preparing. This formula appeared first time in the analysis of stock markets. Well, it's actually quite simple formula. It's actually central limit theorem, basically, uh, after I do it correctly. Uh, and the stock markets is another stochastic system, it's also there. Um, right, and this formula is, is called actually Planck formula usually. Uh, so Planck wrote it, uh, uh, second paper about black body radiation, Planck had it, except uh, he did not say it's uh, light has this energy, he said that uh, like uh, ex exchange of energy happens with this amount. And then she said, no, okay, exchange happens with this amount, but also light have uh, this uh, minimal amount. Uh, all these formulas will happen to be important today. That's why I chose them this year and uh, papers of Einstein. And I will start with Brownian motion, as I say in order, uh, because Brownian motion, uh, it's about big particle moving in this very many other small particles, they push it around, so it's a very complicated movement. Uh, it was considered as an evidence for molecular, uh, molecular or atomic structure of nature. Uh, and I, I, I cannot stop being surprised because 1738, Bernoulli already said, okay, 
we have too many molecules that move chaotically. Moreover, kinetic energy of them is temperature. Uh, he said that, I mean, 1738, and, and uh, in 19th century, uh, kinetic theory of gases and Maxwell distribution was known. It's common legend, I don't know if it's true, that Maxwell derived it in his example uh, uh, for gradation. Uh, I, I mean, the, I, I'm sure that quite a few physicists actually did believe in atoms, uh, but uh, until this kind of years, there are very quite a few people who did not. Uh, it's come back to the story, which I told, uh, keep repeating that it's very hard to believe that the matter that we have here becoming very different and become small. And many could not accept it, I presume, but after this, it was uh, quite accepted. And why are coming to the idea of atoms? Because what we are going to do today, all the day, we are going to ask the question, what is inside? What is inside? What is inside? So I can take a chalk and say, okay, I'm going to cut it in two. Then I cut it, cut it into again and again and again and again. And for how long can I make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller? What will happen? Well, for a long time, uh, it, it, will be, it will be just a very small piece of chalk. Actually, there are 10 to the power 23 uh, molecules here, or atoms. It's, 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 it's a huge number. But if you divide by two, it's not that long that you uh, get out or get rid of molecules. Uh, important things happen when you get to the size of the molecule. And that's why I brought it to the idea that molecules do exist. Because what will happen next is we are going to discuss. What will happen next, uh, happen next is ionization. And this is conceptually something new happens. Until you get to molecule size, everything is that electrically not. But when you break, uh, well, molecule still breaks into atoms, atoms still electrically neutral, but when you start to break atoms, it's completely new situation. You have positive uh, nucleus and a negative electron. This is already different feature, like seriously different. And uh, understanding that there is this positive negative charges explicitly, uh, this is what I want to discuss now, because uh, what I want, I want to show you the very first accelerator. So uh, basically this old style TV, which is called cathode tray uh, um, uh, tube, so the T is for tube, actually, this tube here. Uh, this is uh, uh, ancestor of the first accelerator used by humanity. Uh, this first accelerator used for humanity is called Crookes tube. Uh, the idea that you have here uh, emit emitter of electrons, and there is some another uh, like change of potential, and the electrons just go to an accelerated, and they start to bombard something. The, I mean, the first thing not even discuss what they bombard but just appreciate their existence. This tube was used by Thomson uh, to discover electron. Uh, well, so we are doing physics, physics ex experimental science. And I hope experiment will work. Problem with experimental science, it's not always working. Um, right, so da -da. So this is basically an example of Crookes tube. Uh, just it doesn't look like tube, tube it looks like a ball. Well, that's what I found in the lab. Uh, so you will not see, see anything until I switch off the light. And you still will not see anything because I'm waiting that it uh, gets heated. Oh, you see, it doesn't work because uh, because one. Yeah, because this went loose. So I switch it on now, really. Uh, so now, well, now it will work. Uh, so what's happened here, there is a metal plate. You can, I mean, on the, on the break, you can come here and see for yourself and try yourself. 
but now explain. There is a metal plate which is getting heated. You probably I don't know if you see a little. Do you see a red light? A little bit the reddish. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, that's not the most important part. Uh, but there is something reddish. It's basically just heat uh, metal. It helps electron to escape uh, surface of, of the metal. And what we are going to do now, we are going to apply uh, difference of potentials. Just here, uh, we apply actually 300 volts. So quite a bit. Like it's like the same similar potential we have in the in the outlet, except it's it's stationary current, uh, stationary potential. It's not oscillating. And electrons that emit are getting uh, accelerated. So now I'm, so now it's about uh, 50 to 100 volts, and I increase it. Okay. So uh, this this beam here uh, actually is it's a beam of electrons. And uh, uh, so the point that inside it's quite a good vacuum. There are quite a few molecules. Uh, just enough to get your nice and that you can uh, see electrons. If, if you put just normal air inside, uh, all the electrons will absorb it very quickly, will see nothing. Uh, so just uh, almost a vacuum and uh, just a few molecules left there ionized by the electrons, so you can see them. If there are no molecules at all, then you will see nothing. Uh, so nice thing about this beam is that it's really, really straight. It's, it's not some chaotic movement, it's really very straight. And uh, I mean, you can make it very long and uh, shine against some uh, objects, see shadows and measure. One thing you can do, you can take a magnet. It's here magnet. And you can check that this thing has a charge. Okay, do you see it? So I, I change trajectory of electron uh, by applying magnetic field. And of course, in, in the laboratory, you can know how much magnetic field you applied. You can do it in a controllable way. And you can uh, measure a ratio of electric charge uh, to the mass. So curvature of uh, bending of electron is like this. You see curvature, this curvature here is proportional to ratio of electro electric charge to the mass. So if it's negative, it goes here. If it's positive, it goes opposite way. And uh, it was using magnets it was clear that it was negative charge eventually people realized that it was electrons which carry electricity which was already known because they were running uh, locomotives in, in the london underground already they knew electricity knew how to operate but still still didn't know uh, what is the carrier of electricity but with this experiment they could do it first time they actually did it uh by surprise i did it basically could not believe themselves they got that ratio of electric charge by the mass is a thousand times bigger than they expected. And they discarded it for about 10 years uh, until Thompson did a scrutiny experiment say, no, actually this is correct. This is a thousand times bigger than you think. And it's because electron is just like that. And why a thousand times bigger? Because all the mass of atoms is a nucleus not an electron. Electron is 2,000 times smaller uh, in mass than uh, proton. And people, of course, did not know it in the past. OK, this is experiment. This is what is, uh, was done. OK, on, on the break, you can come and uh, uh, try yourself. It's uh, quite uh, fun how, how it works. Okay, and uh, right, so this is just another uh, uh, um, this is just another incarnation of the same device. Uh, you see that I mean here magnetic field, this is magnet here applied change of direction. So electron was discovered. Moreover, if, if you increase, uh, so I used uh, uh, 300 volts. By the way, here we introduced energy scale. So it should be electron volt. I'm not sure why it's become my family name. Maybe I was too tired to type the slides. Or maybe it was autocorrected. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so it should be electron volt. And electron volt is energy achieved by electron by passing potential of one volt. So when we pass in through this tube in the device I showed you, uh, energy of electron was 300 electron volts. Uh, 
if you do it 5,000 electron volts, uh, electrons actually, uh, when it's quite close to the nucleus, it can emit uh, X-ray radiation. Uh, it's called, uh, in this case, it's called Bremsstrahlung effect. And uh, this X-ray radiation was found by Röntgen, for which he got Nobel Prize. And this is a picture of his wife's hand. Um, well, it was not intentional. Nobody knew that it was harmful, I hope. Uh, and anyway, so uh, this is called cathode, cathode ray tubes, all this stuff. And uh, eventually they were used to, to, to do television. And I still remember I had it at my home before it became a modern television. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you this, that people discovered electron and that there is protons. I mean, because matter is natural. If there are electrons, there should be something which is compensate uh, charge should be positive. And moreover, we know already mass of electron, it's almost nothing compared to the mass of the atom. So everything else is the mass of, a, or, or should be of, of what is positive. It was called proton eventually. And uh, now we actually want to ionize and ask what's happening next. So this ionization is a milestone in now decomposition of, of matter into small things. Uh, actually, we're doing a little bit the opposite what happens with the evolution of, uh, of the universe. This is a plot. Uh, it's not clear num numbers, probably you can see with them, uh, but I will tell you. So here is the temperature. So here it's uh, 5,000 Kelvin, which is surface temperature of, of our sun. And this is uh, 15,000 Kelvin. It's temperature of quite hot so star. The hot stars have temperatures of uh, 50,000 Kelvin, so it's quite here already. And this axis is uh, a fraction of uh, hydrogen atoms that are ionized to proton and electron. So at 15,000 Kelvin, almost all hydrogen atoms become ionized. So uh, it's becoming really full plasma, uh, proton separately, electron separately. That's what happens in very hot stars on the surface. In our sun, actually on the surface, we have hydrogen atoms. We do not have hydrogen uh, ions, we have hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen ions exist inside the star where temperature is much higher. Uh, anyway, uh, after Big Bang temperature very hard, everything was ionized until it becomes a combination epoch, uh, this number of years after the Big Bang. And basically between 15,000 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin is one uh, uh, electrons and protons started to form hydrogen atoms. After, after it's cooled down to 3000 Kelvin, slightly less than temperature of surface of the sun, uh, uh, matter became electrically neutral and all the photons escaped interaction and flew to the sky, to the space. And they flew for 13 billion years until they reach us today. And we observe from the sky, this is called cosmic microwave background. The, 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 the oldest light in, in, in in the universe that we can observe from the sky. Uh, it was 3000 Kelvin when it was emitted, but due to redshift these days, it's only 3 Kelvin, maybe a little bit less even. Uh, anyway, we're going opposite. We're kind of uh, exciting atoms. We want to analyze them. And because now we know that there are electrons and protons, question, uh, really important question, how they combine together. First origin, uh, first idea was by Thomson that this big uh, pink stuff is a proton. It's a big, uh, pancake and blue guys are electrons. Uh, but actually it was disproven by uh, Rutherford Geiger Mars uh, for the experiment. And this uh, is uh, the first uh, uh, LHC style scattering experiment, uh, I would say. If cathode uh, emission was first accelerator, uh, that this is uh, first like good scattering. We accelerated electrons, but we did not much with them. We just hurt them. But now we actually, emit uh, alpha particles. Alpha particles is uh, helium nuclei, which uh, sources radio radioactive elements. They were known by the time. Alpha particle source, and we, and, and we put it, push it towards uh, foil and see what happens. This is typical scattering problem, the same type we do in LHC, just less advanced. Uh, and this was done in 1909, uh, 1913. Uh, it was possible to do it because there was Geiger there who developed Geiger counter. Uh, the, the Geiger counter that you use these days is 1928. It's like 
cheap economic version that you can sell. But early version of Geiger counters appear in 1808, like in Geiger uh, <laughs> experiments, of course. Uh, oh, and he, he used the method what is called Townsend. Uh, I mean, Geiger counter is based on Townsend avalanche. The idea is that you have, if you have a nice particle, if you have a uh, difference of potential, a nice particle can accelerate, uh, hit other particle, this particle will decompose, to, uh, uh, not decompose, uh, an ice again, hit another and become an avalanche of a nice. Uh, so this particle accelerates, hit somebody else, hit somebody else ionized. Two ions go away, hit somebody else, and us again. And this is avalanche process, become bigger and bigger and bigger. So the trick here is to make a fine balance uh, between uh, density of gas. If it's too dense, everything uh, just die off. If it's too, if it's, uh, too um, sparse, uh, this particle will meet uh, nowhere and reach anode. Reach anode. Uh, so it's the same setup as this. Uh, uh, cathode tube you have here, but it's very well aligned uh, density of particles inside that allows for avalanche. And why we need avalanche? Because we want just one single particle, alpha particle, create a lot of one, so we can actually measure the experiments. This is how detection of very small events happens these days. For instance, this is how we detect single photons. So we are detecting single photons by something called photomultiplier. Photo it's exactly this same thing happening. One photon comes and create avalanche of new photons that we register. This is the precursor of modern measurement devices. Uh, and this is how Geiger counter works. Uh, by modern standard, Geiger was postdoc of Rutherford and Marsden was PhD student of Geiger. This, I mean, Hegison is the same name, but there was no postdoc in modern sense. But this is basically how they were related. And they did this experiment. And what they realized that alpha particles uh, pass through gold foil almost is no ref deflection. It's only very few events that was reflection. And uh, it's, they concluded that the nucleus uh, was actually very, very small compared to, to uh, to the size of atom. I mean, you can estimate the size of atom, just uh, take volume if you see and divide number by number of atoms you have there. It will be the size of the atom. So nucleus happened to be very small. And this was a con uh, conclusion. And this conclusion was troubles. So why? Because, I mean, people were not naive. There was a reason to do Thomson model. Because in this model, electron is actually attached to positive charge. When you have positive and electric charge, they want to be together. It's called Coulomb attraction, right? So why this electron doesn't fall on the proton? Why, why not? I mean, it should. Well, if it goes around, it will be like a, a, a Earth going around the sun. The Earth going around the sun is like a Kepler problem, but for it. And that's what people did. This is called, uh, this day for uh, Rutherford at the model, but it doesn't work. It should not work. Some people actually wrote, said, well, yeah, it should be like this. Somehow it doesn't work, but it takes forever. It doesn't take forever. This model, if it's classical, doesn't work. And another example of this doesn't work is called synchro syn synchrotron radiation. It's classical result from classical electrodynamics. And we have charged particle which accelerates, change direction. It emits radiation. If particle goes straight, it will not emit radiation. It will be okay. But if particles bends, actually tangent to its direction will be radiation going out. Emitting radiation means losing energy. Losing energy eventually means losing velocity falling to the nucleus. Through the synchrotron radiation, electron should lose all its energy actually quite fast. You can estimate how fast and fall to the proton. So matter cannot be classically stable. Uh, these days, uh, synchrotron radiation can be a problem, and it can be a benefit. It can be a problem if you want to accelerate particle to very high speeds, because uh, the faster particle goes, the more radiation it will emit if you do it on circles. And uh, the lighter particle is, the more radiation will be there. So for this reason, uh, it's one of, I don't know if it's all the reasons, but definitely it's cost much more energy uh, to, uh, to accelerate electron at the energy scales of LHC. Uh, so you can accelerate electrons to, to gig electron volts. So uh, here it's 
300 electron volts. X-ray happens at kilo electron volts, uh, like 10 times more. Uh, mega electron volts is energy of nucleus. This is 1,000 more, it's giga electron volts. Uh, LHC is tera electron volts, it's 1,000 more. Uh, so, so you actually, it will be very pricey to excite electron more than giga electron volt because of synchrotron radiation. So they do not accelerate electrons, they uh, accelerate uh, hadrons, protons on LHC because they emit less synchrotron radiation. So it's cheaper at that high energies. On the other hand, synchrotron radiation has nice features that can be useful because this beam has, you can have very, very good control on the beam. It's very well focused and you can control its high precision characteristics and it used in very many different applications. I don't, I know only one because I'm theoretician, I don't know much. Uh, one is uh, they try to cure cancer. They shine with, uh, with this radiation on, on tumor cells, killing them because it's very, it can be done in a very precise uh, way. And, but uh, here there is about 20 to 30 different labs. So th this is big accelerator around. Uh, so it's a small one accelerated uh, electrons to 0.7 peak electron volts, then it uh, injected in a big accelerator. And here, uh, they do not want to accelerate it more, they want it to keep going and will constantly radiate. It will radiate this, uh, this radiation. This is, uh, it's very similar to what we saw, right, with the electron. But this is EM light, it's just electromagnetic waves, just very highly energetic, noising uh, things around. And well, this, uh, this is electron moving around, shines beam light here. Here you do some optical devices to turn it around, split, or whatever you do this in optics. And here you have all the computers, devices to measure, and finally here people sitting and typing emails, right? Uh, so this is how it looks. Uh, this is one of the examples of Synchrotron. It was built in 2006. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's situated in Central Energy Atomic France. Um, so why, why, why I chose this one to show? Uh, well, because here, well, let's start from here. This red building is actually Institute of Theoretical Physics. This way I did my PhD. So I never was here, I was never here, but I saw it every day I came to work. Not at working, but it was, uh, I finished my PhD. No, I started my PhD in 2006 and it was kind of, I mean, it was already working, but all this was still construction work, this parking slot, so lots not working yet. There was a lot of, so I saw, saw progress of it starting to work while I'm doing PhD uh, in this building, red building here. And here, this white part is actually actual center of atomic energy, which was a French atomic project. Well, it still is, but it's much was more important in, in like in 50s, 60s. And people who were building nuclear plants have to develop uh, nuclear, different nuclear things. So it's a big thing, this security, you cannot enter that easily. Like they will check, you have a body, it's no so it's a big thing there. We want that to have lunch. Uh, okay, so it's I kind of have good memories for myself. Um, right, so this example of central radiation, what, why I showed it to you, because I wanted to tell you that uh, classical atom in reservoir board type is impossible. This is one problem. Another problem is, uh, is that uh, emission spectrum of hydrogen is not continuous. So uh, uh, this is a standard experiment. Here you have hydrogen, it shines through some slits. And here you have prism like Newton did uh, 400 years ago or even more and splits in different uh, colors. And hydrogen actually shines only very narrow bands. It's discrete. It's example of quantum phenomenon. And this is true for uh, most of, of atoms and molecules they will have the more complicated things, some more bonds you'll have, but it's still, it's still discrete. And it also cannot be explained classically. So first thing was done, Bohr did it. He said, okay, I will postulate that EM radiation doesn't happen. I do not know why. And second, I will postulate that orbits allowed for bi-electron advertised. Postulate this, compute, and he got correct answer. And people were, were very happy just because answer were correct. Uh, I mean, these lines were reproduced on theory using these postulates and this type of Bohr atom picture 
uh, is still, are still quite popular. At least they were popular when I was a student myself. I saw them on different buildings, like on different books. Actually, I have students now, they're wearing experimental uh, uh, shorts. And on the back of them, they have big or eight uh, drone now in 2022. Uh, anyway, uh, it's good that uh, this possibility works, but nobody understands why. And here, we actually need to go to quantum mechanics. So we have to apply wave particle duality and change classical movement by the two wave probabilistic description. We say that electron is not, is not here or there. It's actually a probability wave. And it's probabilistic distributed like, like a jelly around atom. So there are different configurations of orbitals around atom. This is like probably it should be ground state. Uh, no, it's actually first excited state. This is another excited state. They actually didn't show ground state because it's too boring to draw. Uh, this is what's called P orbitals and so on. This is uh, how probabilistic distribution of alpha electron works along height. Uh, this is what follows from hydrogen, uh, from Schrodinger equation uh, and explains uh, how atom uh, is working. But also I need to remind you uh, or those who are new here, tell it for the first time, uh, some of the history interpretation. Because what we're going to do, we're going to do scattering. For scattering, it's very useful. So in quantum, so what it is? In quantum mechanics, uh, it's de facto denial of objective reality. So uh, denial that you can say something about the world without observing it. So if I close my eyes, I cannot say you are here because to, to be sure that you are here, I have to open my eyes and see. Okay, and uh, in quantum mechanics, a big problem. I tried to explain it uh, several weeks ago uh, because seeing, uh, uh, seeing is actually perturbing the system in quantum mechanics. Uh, so I deny uh, knowledge about, so basically I'm agnostic. I deny that you exist or don't exist. I don't know because I do not see. You are here and now I don't know. You are here and now I don't know. So every time I close my eyes, I do not know if you are here. Okay. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, you even cannot ask whether you're here. You can ask the question, I, what is probability that you will be here if I open my eyes? Like 50%, you either here or not, right? This is a standard answer. Uh, so for instance, if you emit electrons, uh, so this is standard double slit story, uh, and you can ask question, what's probability the electron will be here? And there is a prescription to compute it, and this is very interesting prescription because uh, it's mathematical tool. Again, nobody knows that electron is actually there because nobody can measure it. It's forbidden to measure, but it's mathematical tool to compute probability to, for, for uh, electron to be there is to do the following: assume that electron went from the emitter to the final point in all possible ways. Uh, to each way, in this case, there will be two ways. To each way, you associate a complex number. Complex number uh, can be represented, if it's half absolute value, can be represented by a clock. And this complex number will change uh, while uh, electron uh, propagates. Uh, so the point is that if originally complex numbers looked in the same direction, uh, because passes are different, they will uh, become not aligned after movement finished, you see that is line. And then a uh, complex number representing quantum mechanics, what is called amplitude. So this is just a number. Amplitude associated to red pass, like this straight line and blue pass. And what you do next, you have to sum them up using addition of complex numbers. So this is called amplitude, complex amplitude, and it's absolute value square gives you probability. So this is mathematical recycle. Uh, if you want, you don't care about all this mathematical stuff. What you care about is that there are possibility for different things happen at the same time, at least mathematically, well, at least in our imagination. What happens in reality, we don't know. We, we just don't ask the question. But, but it looks like electron does everything at the same time. And in this interpretation, uh, uh, when we come back to uh, this uh, thing here, how to understand that Bohr model actually works. 
because what you can think that electron simultaneously goes this way and the opposite way. Uh, both way uh, predict the same energy, but they will actually ca ca cancel current and ca canceled current will be mean no radiation. So in this uh, past uh, history interpretation, you can kind of explain why Bohr atom worked in principle, because you think about it going one way and another way simultaneously. Okay. Um, so by 1926, uh, structure of atom was understood, uh, was explanation by periodic table. So we successfully decompose atom to electrons, fly away, and to nucleus. Nucleus here, it's now our next problem. Remember, our goal is to reach LHC. So I spent for uh, how much? 45 minutes and 20 years, right? So we need still 100 years to go, right? Uh, so now we came to, to the nucleus. In the nucleus, we have uh, two numbers which are important. What's the charge? And another is its mass. And uh, uh, so now we know the charge is, uh, for instance, for carbon is six. It means there will be six positive things. And, but the mass is 12. So it should be six of something else. Who knows what it is? Uh, so eventually people understood that there's something else that's called natron. Uh, but before we go on here, I want to tell you something which will be very important for everything you uh, should People were able to decompose uh, nucleus uh, without, at the beginning, without shining with uh, all the complicated radiation. In the nature, we have uh, radioactive elements which were discovered in 1896. Uh, radioactive elements emit alpha particles, which is uh, helium nuclei, beta particles, which are electrons. They also emit gamma quants, just photons. And you, you basically see that nucleus, well, see, you can understand that nucleus decomposes. And uh, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that, for instance, Uranus decomposes into krypton and barium, and also three neutrons which fly away. Mm -hmm. So this is a chain reaction which behind uh, atomic plants or, or nuclear bombs. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize that some of masses of uh, barium, uh, krypton and, and the three neutrons is less than the total mass of uranium here. And difference is energy which is emitted and which we use to, to power our nuclear plants. And here, it uh, basically is the first time when Einstein formula e equal mc square becomes useful in practice. Uh, so because speed of life is a very big number, uh, until now, change of mass because of change of energy cannot be perceived in experiment. So if you have think of one mass, think of another mass, uh, put together just sum of masses. So this is example. When putting this together, we give you not this mass, we give you bigger mass. And the difference is actually energy by Einstein formula. Uh, we, by, when we speak about nucleus, we reach the situation when transformation of mass into energy becomes important. And that's what is important uh, about nucleus. It's again, something new. Until now, it was not important. It was just understood, but an experiment played no role. In nucleus, this plays a role. A uh, few words about discovery of natron. So natron was discovered in, uh, in uh, 1932 by Chadwick, he got a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, he actually used experiment of uh, Frederick and Irene Joliet Curie, but he made the correct interpretation of the experiment. Irene Joliet Curie is the, the daughter of Marie uh, Curie. Uh, and by the way, they also got a Nobel for prize, uh, but for a different reason in chemistry. They got the Nobel prize for discovery of uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, non-stable isotope of a chemical element. Also in 1935, the same year. Uh, anyway, so uh, this was a tap. Uh, so they took a source of alpha particles and now they shine on beryllium and you eventually then to the nitron. And this is called beta decay. If you remove all the atoms, what happens? 
is natron uh, decomposes into proton, electron, and also antineutrino. This experiment with no uh, atoms, uh, nucleus attached to it was performed only in 1950. But nevertheless, when you think about this, you say, oh, natron is combination of proton and electron. So it's a composite particle of proton and electron. Well, maybe. The problem is that there's also a beta plus of positron decay. So proton, which is inside the nucleus, can decompose it to neutron and positron and neutrino. It cannot do it by itself. If proton leaves, proton is stable, neutron leaves for about 14 minutes. If it's not inside nucleus, neutron leaves 14 minutes, like it flights in there, 14 minutes. Proton will stay, stay for basically forever. Actually, in, when we speak about theory of everything, we will discuss uh, why people want that proton decays, because uh, ground unification theory predicts that proton will decay into something. Uh, they look for it, but they cannot find it until now. Proton is stable. But even inside nucleus, with many other things around, it actually can decompose into neutron and positron, which is antiparticle to electron. And then we have a paradox. If neutron is, let's say the neutron is, 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 uh, is composed of proton and electron, and proton is composed of neutron and positron, and neutron is composed of proton and electron, and proton is composed of neutron and positron, and, and so on. Uh, so it's like a uh, Russian doll story. Uh, so in reality, uh, at this level, we stop speaking about one particle being consist of another particles. What happens now? That particle start to transform from one from one to another. Instead of splitting them, they transform. What happens that when we want to split them, we supply so much energy that we can create new particles from energy. And this is what different happens in the nuclear scales. It's coming back uh, to this. Here we already see this energy present, but now we actually see that uh, this plays a role because particles play the game. Okay, summary. So we want to look into matter. We know the matter consists of two molecules. This is okay. Molecule consists of atoms. This is also okay. An atom consists of nucleus and electrons. Nucleus is positive charge, electron is negative charge. Uh, and now, because nucleus is very small, electron is negative, for electron not to fall down, we need quantum mechanics to make sense. Big change in our description. But then you say, okay, electrons far away, let's speak about nucleus. Nucleus consists of proton neutrons. And now, neutron decays into proton, but and, and, and uh, electron and neutrino, but it doesn't consist of these particles. And likewise, proton doesn't produce of neutrons. What happens, they transform one to another, uh, and we use Einstein formula to see how it works. Okay, we kind of get it, but what is the correct way to describe everything? Well, that is where we need quantum field theory. So it's the next level of theoretical abstraction. So quantum mechanics was one level of abstraction, but to actually properly describe transformation of particles one to another, we need quantum field theory. Uh, and we get more intuition about quantum field theory uh, from electromagnetism or quantum electrodynamics. So uh, I think it's a good moment to go to break. And so what we are going to do after the break, we start, I will try to explain to you what is quantum field theory. And if I don't succeed, you still stay with me because of that, I will tell you uh, what they did on the LHC anyway. Right. Um, okay, so this first part finished. Let's uh, come back at 15 past seven. Mm. Mm. Welcome back to the second part of quantum field theory uh, lecture. We ended up with saying that uh, we need quantum field theory. And why we do we need it? Because we do not have only quantum mechanics where particle is both, uh, well, everything is both particle and wave at the same time, or more precisely, it's probabilistic wave, which is measured as particle. 
we also need a mechanism that one particle is transformed into another. This is something new. There is one theory in this world where this transformation happens all the time, which is quantum, well, just electrodynamics, because uh, light is always emitted, absorbed. Uh, it's not something that this number of light, amount of light is around, is not something that is preserved. It's the easiest way to transform energy. And uh, this theory was quantized and uh, to quantize everything else, we actually can follow a lot of analogy with how electrodynamics was quantized, eventually realized that all follows very similar patterns. Our main analogy will be quantum electrodynamics, although I will not insist, but you can always think about electromagnetic phase in your head. So we are going to study quantum field theory. There are three words. Word theory means that we agree on a set of rules that we will follow. The word quantum, well, you heard enough of quantum in your life. It's, uh, it will be something about waves and particles. There will be something discrete. Most importantly, there will be possibility. It will be some over alternative evolutions. This is what about quantum. But there is new word, which is field. Yeah, okay, I mean, is it about that? You know, uh, people use the word field because they were tired of using the word waves. Uh, because they also could say quantum wave theory, but then it will be fully confusing. But it will be actually more understandable what they mean. So in, in physics, field is actually anything that depends on coordinates. Uh, so what we are having here, so if you have actual field, then we introduce like a surface, introduce X, Y coordinate system. And in this direction, we have something. Well, I just put some height function, call it phi, but it can be colors of flowers, uh, smell of flowers. It should be some parameters that somehow depends on coordinates in which you live. Anything that depends in some way, uh, anything valued somewhere in principle can be called field. In practice, of course, most like most often it will be some explicit number, complex number. Here it's real, but it's usually complex. Uh, anyway, every time you confuse, think about waves in, in the sea. It's also relaxing. Uh, so what, what, what field here is actually height of, of this ripple as coordinate. So it will be, so this is like when everything is still, there is nothing, then field is zero. When it's uh, waves, then field part which is up and some part which is down. Uh, yeah, so if you say waves instead of field, it will make full sense. Uh, before we go to, let, let's keep nice slide. Um, I will show you one dimensional field. So the only dimension that they have is the, along the length of, of this spring. So Sasha, be careful. I, I fixed it, but who knows? Okay. So. <laughs> it's a good decision, yeah. So now uh, it's not excited. So field everywhere is zero. Now I'm going to make excitation of the field. So this is vacuum. Now I make excitation. And it propagates with certain speed. which should be called speed of light for the system. Or if it's a material, it will be called speed of sound. And I can make several excitations. So uh, what I'm doing, I'm in mathematics, I just put coordinate along this line and plot the height of, I mean, how high it was excited. This example of uh, excitations, which are transversal to the propagation of a wave. 
So yeah, this is a wave. Signal propagating is a wave. Yeah, boom, boom. And uh, uh, this is example of transversal excitation. Actually, there are two ways to do them, like this, and also like this. This is more dangerous one. Oh. There, you can make a superposition, you can rotate. You can also make standing waves. I will try to make higher frequency, yeah? Standing waves. You see, it, it's actually there are nodal points that do not move. Okay. But uh, this is example when we have one dimension. Uh, here it's two dimension, here it's only one dimension, but we have actually two possible excitations, this direction and this direction. And we can again make actually they form a vector, dimensional vector, we can make any combination. So this is example of transversal excitations. And uh, this is most important for us today, but uh, in nature, uh, sound waves, for instance, are not transversal. Uh, they are uh, they actually in the same direction as, as their uh, propagation. And for this, I have another example of a field or wave. So because of friction, it will very quickly decay, but still you can see signal propagation. So you see excitation in the same direction as, as, as direction. This is longitudinal signal propagation. So all the fields can be understood on these analogies. Important part about fields that um, uh, you, if you have one excitation, another excitation you can add. So for instance, here we have one bump and on this rope I showed you another bump, opposite direction. And um, uh, so when this bump move, they actually add up. And this is an example of destructive interference. I mean, I mean, actually, in English doesn't make sense. It's just interference. There is no constructive interference if you use English as a native speaker. But nevertheless, people say destructive and constructive interference. Uh, like you see, so actually, waves can cancel away, it can be nothing. Or if they're in the same direction, they become bigger, right? So usually when you have waves, you have some oscillation, so things look uh, more interesting, something like this. And now uh, in reality, we can have very many different oscillation modes. So for instance, here I took 12 different oscillation modes. So this is constant, this is one, uh, one peak, this is two oscillations, this is three and so on. And uh, they actually exponentially decrease in uh, amplitude, so become less a weaker, weaker. So now I am going to add them up all together. For the moment, I add in only the first one, and then this equals zero, it's mean only first wave. Then I make a sum of this guy and this guy, two of them. When I make sum of two, oh, it doesn't work this way. This is one, uh, so this is sum of two, this is sum of three, this is sum of four, five, six, seven, and sum of all. So uh, look, this were all waves, like a sine, normal sine function, oscillated normally. But when they add them together, they form something that doesn't look like oscillating stuff. It looks like uh, just a bump. Uh, so it's something local in time. So uh, by super, uh, so adding up waves, uh, adding up fields is called superposing. I mean, they use different words, superposing. When superpose them, we can make some bumps. And this bump, bump some, sometimes can be interpreted as localized particle. It's in good place. Uh, so if you have this bump, you can say, okay, this particle more or less hold have different defined position. Uh, in mathematics, uh, decomposition of this bump into, into signs of given frequency 
is called Fourier transform. And this important mathematical statement uh, that any function can be written as a sum of a sine function. So we have to sum over all possible frequencies. Um, so for instance, this is sine zero x, this is sine one x, sine two x, and so on. Um, our ear is very good Fourier analyzer. Uh, so we, we receive uh, signals and uh, ear uh, decomposited to frequencies is how we understand music. Uh, I actually forgot uh, on the break, we can try a telegram uh, on computer and uh, and you can uh, sing your favorite song and see how what frequencies do you have. Uh, it's actually a very fun exercise. We don't know going to do it now. And uh, Fourier transform is useful for many reasons. For instance, when I was speaking about statistical physics, we were discussing how we were discussing how we can check that elections are fal falsified. So, uh, for instance, let's take about uh, uh, let's take for instance blue uh, blue line here. So it's uh, uh, election 2016, certain elections. And in this direction, uh, uh, how many, so blue line corresponds how many people did show up in a given, uh, there are many different voting polls. And uh, number in here, it's in, uh, like uh, percentages of voting polls that had this number of percentages of uh, uh, people that came compared to the maximal amount. Yeah, so, so turnout can be 40% of maximum, 60% of maximum, and different voting polls will have different turnout. And so uh, if you plot the uh, number of people coming versus uh, turnout uh, versus number of polls that had this turnout, this will be this blue curve according to, to data which you can find online. So what you can, uh, now the question, uh, what you can do, you can make Fourier transform of this. And when you do Fourier transform, then you see that there are peaks at 1%, inverse and 2% inverse. So uh, it means that here the steps of one and two per uh, two percent or one and half percent is the most uh, probable. Well, this means that uh, it was uh, fabricated data because uh, steps and integer uh, is improbable if you do honest uh, turnout for elections. Yeah, so these two peaks uh, just tell you that this data was fabricated. Uh, this example of usage Fourier transform. Anyway, so when we speak about field, we are going to decompose it into frequencies, uh, into sine waves with some coefficients. And uh, we will focus on these numbers now. This will be, I will see what it will be now. Uh, decomposition to frequencies with light is, is, uh, is used all, a lot. So colors, it's light of different frequencies. Uh, if you go to uh, lower frequencies, so, so long wave lengths, you have infrared. So you have what you have uh, in mobile phone and microwaves. And if you go to high frequencies, like very often, that's why you have X-rays, the one we spoke of, the Rutherford found. And gamma rays, which uh, is even high more in genetic radiation, All right? Uh, so the hydrogen spectrum or emission spectrum lies here. In this, uh, well, I mean, it actually lies not only here, there is infrared and ultraviolet, uh, just you do not see it, but visible part is, is here. So decomposition of light into frequencies or wavelengths, it's, it's, it's very typical things we do all the time. Rainbow is example of this decomposition. Uh, anyway, so this I try to explain what is field. Now coming back to the question what's quantum. Okay. So quantum, at least naively, will put constraints on this now. Values and here we come to the third uh, out of four papers uh, I, I claimed from Einstein about Planck Planck formula. So energy of light can be only uh, so photons have energy equal to Planck constant and frequency. This frequency here, one photon, and you have two photons. If you put here two, then it actually means that you have this way and you have exactly the same wave twice. This will be two photons. So, but like very naively, what happens that if you have this constraint that energy equal to this number, this means that this uh, coefficients cannot be arbitrary. This is like first impression that you have from quantization. 
And then you say, okay, uh, uh, well, classically, we know that energy of a wave is square of this height. This is classical result from electromagnetism. So what does this mean? If energy is constrained to this number, it cannot be less. It means that there is some amplitude, the smallest possible amplitude in the wave cannot be smaller. Uh, but this is against uh, uh, objective uh, denial of quantum mechanics. Uh, so we cannot actually draw this picture in quantum world because to be able to draw this picture, we should be able to measure it. But we definitely do not measure this picture. So this picture in reality doesn't exist in quantum world. So there is no such thing as minimal possible amplitude uh, because there is no amplitude in this sense. Uh, when you measure, you measure something else or like locally. So correct interpretation is actually quite astonishingly surprising. I did not tell you everything. I just told you that uh, we have coordinate dependence, but in reality you also have time dependence. Uh, and actually coefficient, and this we were going to discuss uh, uh, just in a second, this coefficient in quantum world already tells you, in, regardless about this coefficient here, already tells you that your wave has energy H omega because energy is related to time translation, okay? And this coefficient here, I, I, it should be A here. It's not even a number. In quantum field theory, this coefficient stop being a number. It st starts to be operator that creates or destroys photon. So what is written here, sum over all possible photons, we are going to create or destroy them. Uh, this will be their energy. And this actually controls uh, probability or amplitude of probability for that to happen. This is the meaning of the uh, quantum field and quantum field theory. It's some of all possible things that can happen. Do you remember that quantum mechanics is about, we have to consider all possibilities, sum them up with certain uh, weights. That's what we are doing here. Uh, we summing up over all possibilities to create photons. This CK creating photons. Uh, this KX tell you what is amplitude, what is complex number associated to this event. And this omega tells you what is energy of the corresponding photon. This is what is quantum field. So, and here actually it's explained a little bit um, more uh, clear. Uh, so again, so remember that probability of something to happen is absolute value of A square. And this A is computed to sum of all possible histories. And this I wrote it again. So the will actually will be two types of thing. Uh, possibility to create something with certain amplitude. So then let's say that his red history is history of creation of particles. And blue history is a history of uh, destroying particles. And quantum field is us is sum over all histories. Uh, this just says that particles was created and this is amplitude for that to happen. And this is particle was destroyed and this amplitude was, uh, this was to happen. So this is uh, what is quantum field is. Uh, well, and now I, I should have done this. I, I cannot not draw a Feynman diagram and try to explain what it is. Uh, so uh, Feynman diagrams is actually, it's uh, so this Odin, so Odin on the slate here is holding Feynman diagram in his, his hand. Right. It's a tool to, uh, to travel across the nature. But what this Feynman diagram means? Well, uh, so this is example of electron electron scattering. Uh, so we have two electrons. Uh, and in simple words, uh, the two electrons fly. This electron emits photon. It propagates here. It's been absorbed to this electron, they fly away. But how to make it mathematical? So uh, we want to ask question, what is the probability of this to happen? Or more precisely, what is amplitude of this to happen? Because if you know amplitude, probability is square of it. So what we have to do, we say, okay, first of all, we were given conditions that particle did existed, and they still exist here. So if particles existed, uh, this picture says that, okay, uh, actually uh, we are going to destroy them. So when there is no plus, uh, it means the destruction of particles. And psi, right, because they have the uh, electrons. So electrons are denoted by letter psi, uh, not A. 
that's only thing. So we are just so this is just saying we are going to destroy this particle, so nothing else. And here we say we are going to create photon with momentum Q and also create another particle with another momentum K3. And when this photon arrives here, we are going to destroy it and create another particle. So this is destroyed destruction of particles, creation of a photon, destruction of photon, creation of particles. And finally, uh, two more things. Uh, here we have E is electric charge, and it's actually number, uh, this amplitude number associated to, to amplitude of probability for this to happen. So you have to write some of all things that can happen in the world, but then you have to assign numbers for each thing to happen. So uh, amplitude uh, for this particle to be destroyed and photon and another electron being created is equal to a number, which is called electric charge. Uh, and amplitude of propagation of photon from here to here is equal to one over Q square, where Q is its momentum. Uh, and then you just write everything together and you do a computation. So if, if, if I do everything correctly, you will get Coulomb potential here. But of course, I skipped quite a, quite a bit of things. But uh, for those who knows, Fourier of one over Q square is Coulomb potential. This is the most important part of it. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of decorations which you have to skip, but look just here. We, we killed two particles, created photon with probability, with amplitude E, it propagated with this amplitude. Uh, then a photon was killed uh, and two, photo, two electrons was created with this amplitude. So this is what is behind the Hamann diagrams. Uh, if you understand this principle, great. And that's uh, an real world co co computation with just a lot of decoration around which is unpleasant mathematical stuff, uh, or it might be pleasant if you like uh, complicated mathematical stuff. It depends uh, what you like, but it's a lot of, it's, it will be a lot of indices. It will be quite a mess. I, I'm not going to show it. Uh, well, computing of Feynman diagrams is the basis of, of, of like for perturbative quantum field theory. And this is what people did. And uh, uh, what is the achievements of QFT? There are two uh, important, uh, more precisely quantum dynamics, uh, there were two important errors. 1930s, when actually it was not really still QFT seriously, it was basically applying Einstein theory of relativity to quantum world. Uh, and I want to discuss with you one thing seriously and the rest thing not seriously. Uh, I want to discuss with you seriously classification of relativistic part. I probably will go to the slide which I need for this here. Uh, don't look yet, look at me. I'm going to tell you something. So I told you we're going to do quantum field. Now I'm focusing on what theory. I'm going to declare for you the rules of the game. So rule number one, we are going to be quantum. This means we are going to compute amplitudes using quantum rules. And rule number two, we are focusing on rule number two now. We are going to say that we believe in Einstein special relativity. What does it mean? That, uh, so in, uh, Einstein principle of relativity says that if we translate our system that we just change our coordinate and go so as it's change our coordinate system here, Description should not change. It says, if we translate in time, it's, it's was translation in space. I cannot show translation in time. Well, probably I have to go to sleep for this. I don't know. Uh, so if it translates in time, description will not change. It's another symmetry of the system. If we rotate, description will not change. There are three ways to rotate. And finally, if we boost, a description will not change. Boost, it means we go into reference frame, which moves at constant speed to respect to reference frame that we are now. So we can translate in space, translate in time, rotate and boost. And we say that we want quantum mechanics, which satisfies this property. And already this is enough to give you a classification of particles. Well, not like, uh, you will see what, what I mean by this. Uh, Invariance on the translation in time, this is an important theorem in physics, uh, tells you that 
particle would have fixed energy that is conserved. So energy is uh, something you always link to time. So if I'm pair, if time is symmetry, then energy will be conserved. So every particle in this setup will have fixed energy. Translation in space uh, tells you that each particle which have momentum, uh, mv basically in classical, in, in non-relativistic world, momentum of particle which is conserved. So energy and moment conserved. Uh, invariance under boost will mean that this combination of energy and P the momentum, this combination will be constant. This what does it mean in variance on the boost? And in special relativity, this is called computing interval. Or it's like uh, it's like a Minkowski Pythagorean theorem. This was Sasha was telling us last time. And because it's a constant, this constant should have physical significance. And its physical significance, it's mass squared times C4 of the part. So mass of the particle is a constant that appear in this combination, which should be constant by symmetry principles. So we already know that a particle has energy, momentum, and this is a combination gives you mass. So it also have fixed mass. Then there are two types of particles, massive when this is non-zero and massless when this is zero. Both particles exist in the world. If the particle is massive, we can find reference frame when it doesn't move. Then this is zero, and this formula reduces to famous Einstein formula, E equal mc square, right? So if this is not here, then you take square root on both sides, you get here. Uh, so Einstein formula is actually a particular case in this more general relation. And uh, if particle is massless, you cannot find frame that it's, it stands still. Massless particles always move, moreover, they move with the speed of light, always. Uh, this uh, just always speed of light. In this case, uh, the, the energy can be found using Planck and Stein through frequency. In this case, they should be waves like no other way around, and this will be uh, in Stein Planck formula. Um, so, by the way, this on the left, so this was uh, this more or less clear on classical world, but in quantum world, it was uh, understood by uh, Wigner. It's 1931. And this tells you that particles has mass, energy, momentum, uh, and all this property exist. And then also, uh, after we all see all this, it's good moment to introduce God-given units, because of, like taken with you for the whole of your life, H bar and C everywhere the place, it's, it's just, it's, it's becoming, I don't know, mm, uh, not boring, but you are tired to do, you're, it's becoming tiresome because, uh, well, you just write equal, equal to e energy equal to mass. And the moment you do this, you actually can measure uh, masses of particles using energy units. And that's what is done in particle physics. Uh, you remember what is electron volt? I had this device here. So electron volt is energy that is achieved by electron by passing through potential one volt. Now, because it puts equal to one, uh, energy is also used to measure mass. So mass of electron is not one electron volt. It's uh, electron volt is a feature of charge, not of mass. Uh, mass of electron is actually 500,000 electron volts. It's quite a lot. Uh, but proton is still 2,000 times uh, uh, harder. And um, actually, but, uh, well, so frequency is one over second. So energy is inverse proportional to units of, of time, but also when C is equal to one, uh, one meter is the same as one unit of time. So energy and, the, and distances are inverse proportional to one another. And, and, and you can compute that uh, related to these energies, you have size of 10 to the power of minus 15 meters, which is typical size associated to prot. And well, that's slightly more complicated. Uh, I mean, it's complete conclusion in reality more difficult, but it actually works. For, I mean, for reasons which you know, <laughs> not explain. Uh, anyway, so uh, basically, what what you follow now, I will always write masses of particles using energy units, electron volts. That's what is doing happening in, in, in LHC and other accelerators. Uh, right. Which symmetry law did I forget? 
I did not use all symmetries. Yeah, I did not use rotation. I used translation in space, time, and also boost change uh, given velocity. So boost gives me this formula. There is also rotation. So uh, for particles, interesting because a priori particles do not have size. At least, if, I mean, if they're elementary, they definitely don't have size. But they compound, they can have size. But if the elementary, they don't. And rotating point light particle is pointless. <laughs> Right, I mean, you cannot rotate the point. Nevertheless, particle can change uh, under rotation, and the way how it changes uh, is called spin. And uh, it's it's mathematical description, and uh, 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 so in the case of massive particles, we have spin. In the case of mass, we have helicity. Uh, uh, so let's speak about massive particles. So spin, it's it's feature of the, how particle changes when you rotate it. And there are two types of particles in the world. Uh, those who have even spin. Uh, in reality, uh, well, we have zero, one, and two. Zero is Higgs boson, one is photon, and also you will see what else, and two is graviton. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, I promised to speak about massive particles. Well, anyway, almost. Uh, so th these particles are called, uh, well, th the integer spin particles, they're all together called bosons. And there are half integer particles, uh, which are uh, quarks, actually proton, neutron as well, uh, electrons, also neutrinos. This example of half integer particles all they are named actually have spin one half. They are all called fermions. What is important about bosons and fermions? So bosons, uh, so in quantum world, particles are indistinguishable. Uh, bosons, uh, they like to, but uh, the difference is the following, that bosons like to be together in the same state, and you can accumulate this number of bosons together in the same place. And bosons will be the guys who transmit interactions. You actually can make it a very uh, strong flux, flux, flux of bosons and create quite strong interaction. Uh, uh, and electrons or fermions, uh, these are particles uh, uh, that do not want to be in the same state. They always want to occupy different states. And this is very important to create better around us. So, I am not falling through this table, or maybe I do, uh, because electrons from my hand uh, do not want to be in the same state as electron in this table. So creation of massive matter, and not massive, but like vo vo voluminous matter, is the fact that uh, matter is contained from fermions. So we have two, two, two teams, bosons spin zero, one, Particles and fermions spin one half elementary, and three half can be another uh, spin uh, can be for composed particles. Uh, so this is what is called the called spin statistic term. It's very important. Uh, so this was where early. So I told you about early achievement of quantum field theory. We got the idea about classification of relativistic particles. We split them into bosons and fermions. Fermions form matter, and bosons form uh, uh, forces of interaction. And also a prediction of antiparticle happened. Well, but this is actually was the easiest part because the only thing you say that when you write this formula, uh, you know, you probably know how to solve quadratic equation. You can have two signs. And you have to do something with this. Uh, and so negative sign eventually can get interpretation of antiparticle. But I'm not going to go into details about this part. Uh, so this was, but this was easy part of, actually uh, of quantum field theory. Uh, the, the, the real stuff happened uh, about 10 days later because when I told you that you have to sum over all possibilities, you actually really have to sum over all possibilities. And it's not only that electron flies, emits photon, 
and this photon is received by the other electron. Actually, while electron flies, it can emit another photon, and this photon can emit electron and positron, electron positron pair, uh, which is called vacuum polarization. Electron positron fly around, collide together, make another photon, come back. Or electron flies emit photon, and this photon comes back to the same electron. Uh, it's, yeah, so uh, and there is thousands you can write. I, I, I mean, thousand is not like abstract. I mean, it's combinatorially big number. And people who do this computation, they suffer from this. Uh, well, this one savior, every time you write this uh, three particle place, you have another value of electric charge appearing and two values of electric charge together called um, fine structure. It's one over 137. So every time becomes smaller and smaller. So writing two, two messy diagrams is, uh, is uh, becoming less and less correction. That's why we can make precise computation. But there is a much bigger problem that if you sum over all possibilities here, I mean, so here when this photon emits electron and positron, uh, they can be of any moment. And if you integrate over a possible momentum, you actually get infinity. There are infinitely many possibilities. So real computation will give you infinity. And people struggled for so many years to subtract two infinities together, get finite number. This is called renormalization theory. So this gentleman uh, did the, did the job. Feynman Schinger Tomonaga got a Nobel Prize for this. And uh, they explain how to subtract infinities. Important thing to understand, to remember now that it's possible, and there is some theorem that it is possible. And after you did a lot of work, you can uh, predict this number, whatever it is. It's a spin of a particle, this is magnetic moment. Uh, so this is experimental value, and, and this is theoretical computation. So all these digits, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine digits match. So quantum electrodynamics uh, is, is actually the most precise theory existing in nature. None of the theoretical computation can give you nine digit, nine digit precision which matching this experiment. Quantum electrodynamic does. This was really a huge achievement all of the field. And after you see this matching, you really believe that it's correct theory. Um, there are two important conclusions. Uh, one conclusion is uh, uh, to get this uh, secret word renormalization, not all interactions will be allowed. And today I will allow myself not explain what are not allowed because I still have lecture in two weeks about grant unification and I will have chance to explain there because that will be appropriate. So, but mind that not all of the type of interaction allowed to get this important result, the normalization of the theory. And important conclusion number zero, that uh, to achieve renormalizability, you need to speak about gauge symmetry. Again, I will speak about gauge symmetry seriously in two weeks, but I will give you just brief idea of what it is. Uh, when I did uh, this story about to uh, complex number changing. So this is not the clock, it's not time, it's complex number changing. I just draw clock because it's visually nice. Um, uh, there is no actually background understanding uh, how fast the clock can change. And in reality, there is something in the ground which tell you how fast it can change. This something is uh, called gauge field, and this gauge field is actually happens to be electromagnetic field. So electromagnetic field is about how this uh, complex number will change fast. Uh, this is completely new understanding of, of, uh, of electro electromagnetic field, and I will speak about this much more uh, in two weeks. However, I also want to mention that next week we are going to have lecture about general relativity, about gravity, and there is another gauge symmetry there, which is uh, different reference places have different geometry, and this is kind of the same idea, and maybe Sasha will speak about this. I don't know, but it's most likely will happen in some way. So for the moment, just 
keep this word in, in your head and wait, then it will become explained more uh, in future events. Uh, right. So these were lessons from uh, doing quantum to letter dynamics. Uh, okay, I finished uh, with math and now we come back to particle load. Um, so when, where we stopped? Uh, we stopped with the nuclear decay and bombarding these alpha particles as a nucleus to produce even more decays. This is what experiment we are doing. Uh, for instance, to show that the uh, neutron decomposes into proton and, and uh, electron. Uh, but people understood that's super nice. We can get many results. Let's look for new sources of, of, of particles that we can collect. What people did next is they, uh, they, uh, they uh, bought balloons and went to, to, to atmosphere because actually there are a lot of particles which fly from the space. So far away from uh, our solar system, uh, there are black holes and there are explosion of supernovas uh, of the stars. Uh, this is highly energetic events that create uh, highly energetic uh, particles, protons and uh, alpha particles. And they fly through the space. Space is reasonably empty, come to Earth, come to atmosphere, and atmosphere they start to interact with atom atmosphere producing avalanches of, of different events. And the only thing you have to do, you have to bring uh, your, uh, I mean, this type of things, except they now look differently, they call twists of chambers and uh, measure the events. So this is photos from Wilson chambers. So for instance, this is the discovery of positron. So particle which flew from the sky, passes through some medium, uh, which was immersed into magnetic field. And uh, this curving correspond to uh, charge mass ratio, the same for electron, but it was curved in opposite direction. Uh, so it's kind of the same as electron, but has opposite charge. That's how positron was discovered. And later, okay. Mm. And then people also discovered uh, muons and pions. And uh, why this was, this is, uh, I presume it's uh, discovery of muon, is, is for, if I remember correctly. So why it was important? Well, I remember from diagrams, electron flies and it's photon. And here another thing. And so this is, when this is amplitude of probability of this photon, uh, then it gives you long range interaction, which is called bump interaction. Then uh, people understood that something is wrong with alpha particles scattering through hydrogen. When alpha particle come very close to hydrogen atom, uh, electric interaction doesn't work to describe the experiment. And there should be some new type of interaction which should be short range. And Hideki, uh, Hideki Yukawa proposed that now amplitude of probability of this guy is not one over two square, but changed. And this guy actually is massive. Um, if it's massive, then actually this corresponds to the fact that the action will be short. And well, eventually they found the particle, uh, which is called these days pion, which corresponds to this interaction. Uh, yeah, so this is how they found it. Okay. Uh, so but they did not only found uh, muons, pions, positrons, they found uh, dozens and hundreds of particles. And by the uh, by the few 1950s, people already started to build big machines, like almost modern accelerators, and they produce high energy uh, rays in, in laboratory. And they're describing hundreds of thousands of particles. And so, so now it become a problem. So uh, uh, Will Slump uh, received Nobel Prize and he said in 1955, uh, if before funny elementary particle used to be rewarded by Nobel Prize, such a discovery now ought to be punished by a fine, if not by a prison. Uh, because what we can do, we can go to Wikipedia, let's try. 
And just look on the quartz. So there is a quartz left on this. Let's, let's go to baryons. Mm, is it correct one? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, it's kind of here. Uh, oh, did I miss it? I, I remember. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this, this is what I want to look. Yeah, thank you. Yes. List of variants. So there is proton, neutron, lambda, chunk lambda, bottom lambda, sigma, sigma plus, uh, sigma minus, charm sigma, charm sigma plus, charm sigma zero, bottom sigma, bottom sigma one, bottom sigma. Key, key, charm, key, charm, 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 prime, charm, key, prime, double charm, key, double charm, key, bottom chi or cascade P, bottom chi or cascade P. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just for spin one half. Uh, then we start delta, delta, zero, delta plus. Okay, so do, do you get at the point? This is all the particle which you have discovered, and this is only baryons because baryons, the guys, uh, with uh, three quarks inside. There are also mesons with two quarks, that's also a big list. And there is uh, other complicates. So it became a mess and everything was found in, in the lab uh, or in the cosmic rays and something has to be done with it. Where is PowerPoint? Was it in Chrome? No. Uh, did, where did you save it? Is it PDF or it is? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, All right, so there was a big mess and people tried to understand how to organize it. And uh, Gelman and Neiman proposed the eightfold way to, to organize things. They actually understood that everything can be characterized by strangeness, whatever it is, and electric charge. And uh, so uh, mesons, like a certain type of mesons, it has a spion, which is, was discovered for explaining interaction of alpha particles is uh, proton. Uh, it's somewhere here. And there's also something called counts. They form together eight, six here and two here. There is baryons. It's neutron and proton are actually here. Look, they're here and the other guys. And they're like uh, spin three half baryons. So things start to look nicely together. Uh, and this was explained by existence of, uh, so I mean, if you have all this mass, you probably don't believe this all this mass is elementary particles, right? You think they actually they still compose of something else. And so this gentleman proposed that there are should exist three elementary things called uh, quarks. There are three of them, up, down, and strange. All together, they make these nice patterns. And actually, they use what is called in, in, in mathematics representation theory of SU3 group. Uh, for those who know this, is not SU3 of QCD, it's a different one. Uh, and uh, next week in Uppsala, Eduardo is speaking about symmetry and probably he will speak a little bit about what this actually means. Anyway, so they said that these three guys can explain all this mess. And this is how idea of course appeared. And uh, again, I save myself uh, for two weeks. In two weeks, I will tell more. 
but brief, uh, so quarks should be described, so quarks were proposed as new elementary particles, which, are, uh, so protons will consist of quarks, uh, but be behind this is other history is history of quantum chromodynamics. So we had quantum electrodynamics with quantum theory of uh, electromagnetism. So here we have uh, chromomagnetism, well, chromo, I mean, chromodynamics, I don't know how to say it. Uh, and uh, so some, some milestones of this. First, it was pure theoretical idea. Uh, you remember this was gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry is about how you parameterize this moving complex number. And uh, again, it's related to possibility to do, uh, well, let me tell it is geometry. Uh, so this complex number moving around the circle. Uh, but what if you replace the circle with another object? You can replace it with two dimensional, uh, well, three dimensional sphere and move a number in a sphere. This will be called SU2 non abelian theory or you can replace it with even eight dimensional uh, space. And you replace it the circle with a dimensional thing, it will be uh, gauge symmetry behind quantum chromodynamics. And because it's eight dimensional, you will have eight analogs of photons, which are called uh, gluons. So this first was proposed uh, theoretically by Young and Mills, uh, but it wasn't accepted because it wasn't physically evidence. Um, so again, I hope to speak about this more in two weeks. Now it's a little bit too unclear what this means. Then there was a problem. I told you that um, electrons, uh, um, so fermions do not want to be together. Uh, electrons can be spin up, spin down. And so uh, at least because they spin up, spin down, two things can be together. But inside nucleus, uh, inside of protons, there are three quarks. So spin up, spin down is not enough. You need three different things to make them together. And that's why people suggested that quarks have three colors. Uh, uh, then there was a question, okay, quarks is elementary particles, are they point-like, like electron? And people did not agree first. Gelman say, no, they're not, actually because they're so small, at the small, small scale, they finally space-time breaks. It's no longer continuous. And Feynman said, no, 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 they have like electrons. And then it was deep analytic scattering experiment. So this is a picture of it, uh, which um, told you that actually uh, they indeed point like. Uh, then there was a story about the symptomatic freedom. Again, I will speak about this in two weeks seriously. Uh, and the proof of renormalizability. And Hofford Milton got another way, uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, so, and twice was, but uh, what I want to emphasize now that uh, gluons, uh, which analogs of photons, uh, do something new. They actually can self interact. So, gluon in Feynman diagrams can emit a gluon which come back. And this, uh, so if this electron positive pair polarizes your vacuum, Gluon self polarized vacuum. So it doesn't require any fermions to do it. And because of this, you have a problem of confinement. Uh, so we say that uh, neutrons and protons consist of quarks. Can we smash protons that hard to, to take quarks apart? Like, well, we were able to ionize atoms, we were able to split nucleus. Let's now split neutron or proton. Well, people tried, tried hard and they could not. And this is related a lot to self polarization of gluon field. This is a confinement problem. It's still unsolved normally, like not proven rigorously, but there are a lot of numerical simulations within lattice and QCD. And so uh, this is meson. It's uh, a particle consisting of two quarks. And what happens, um, so uh, if you try to move quarks away, uh, then uh, self gluon will self-polarize the vacuum and create what is called flux tube uh, between two quarks and it will increase in energy. So pulling quarks apart uh, will increase, increase energy. And if you really try to put them too far apart, the energy will be so, so high that in between here, two new quarks will emerge. 
And the only thing which will happen is that your meson will split into two new mesons, but quarks will not be separated. And when you have three quarks, which is like neutron or proton, the, the same stuff happening. Uh, this flux tube polarizes vacuum and becomes like this. So uh, we say these days that protons consist of, of, of quarks. However, you cannot split proton. It still stays together. And this is a difference compared to our previous, because of what is we're trying to do all the day to split things together in small, smaller pieces. We reach the point, we know what is inside, but we cannot take it out. And uh, quarks are considered as elementary particles. And finally, uh, so I told you a little bit about quarks. And finally, we come back to our story before the break. So we started from the story that neutron transform into proton and electron. You see that do not work the word decay into proton electron. I will use the word transform. For, and also antineutrino. From the so if you seriously believe in this in this diagram, in, in this process, you have to draw the full uh, Feynman diagram. Neutrons fly. So here, be, the, here will be destruction operator of neutron and creation of operator for three other guys. It is called four fermionic interaction because all four guys here are fermions, a spin one half particles actually. Uh, and uh, this secret word renormalizability. So this interaction is uh, non renormalized. If you look in all our previous Feynman diagrams, they will always the same type. It was fermion flies, emits boson, either photon or gluon, and another fermion receives it. It follows for this type. It could be decorated of this all, 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 all corrections in yellow, but it's just dressing for star, dressing for things. If the process is of this type, then theory ends up to be renormalizable and things are nice. So then it will be natural to expect that in reality, this is not what is happening. That actually neutron flies, destroys, emits uh, something, and um, also proton is created. The something goes and interacts with antineutrino and electron, or let's say decomposes into, I mean, in this case, it decomposes into neutron and electron, antineutrino and electron. So we would like to find this interaction field to make it similar, and then we hope that it will be renormalizable. It makes sense in, 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 in theory. Uh, but then uh, the problem comes that uh, 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 experience shows that this interaction is short range, and this vector should here should be. Uh, so first of all, this should be vector field, uh, and it should be massive. And if it's massive, and it just random vector field, which is massive, you can have problem with the normalizability. This is problem number one. And problem number two, uh, that it's kind of, kind of suggests that this happens, suggests that neutron and proton actually uh, somehow related. And so also of an antitrain electron. Is it like the same particle but different states? So this is a question. Uh, this is at least a little bit philosophical, but this is important. If you have vector uh, particle, which is massive, you again have problem with renormalizability. And uh, to solve this problem, people suggested Higgs mechanism. So finally, I came to Higgs mechanism. Uh, Higgs particle is actually was proposed as a scalar boson, which uh, for the moment I just say it uh, causes spontaneous breakdown of your two gauge symmetry. And in two weeks, I spent half of the time explaining what does this mean. So Higgs boson was proposed to resolve this problem. This was bad. Something should exist here, but this something should be massive. But if it's massive, uh, theory is mathematically still inconsistent. And uh, there should be mechanism to make it massive, and Higgs boson was proposed for this mechanism. And it was, to my knowledge, the only reasonable proposal. Uh, I, I'm sure that there were other ones, but others did not survive for one another reason, and people were looking for Higgs boson seriously. And so, finally, one of the reasons to build large harmonic and collider was to detect Higgs boson. Because 
if we found it, then everything we said about uh, particle physics start to make sense. And okay, they build it, but what are they doing with the experiment? Okay, so actually it's, it's not just one circle. It's quite a bit of things around. First of all, there is uh, this part here, uh, creation of a beam. So there is one accelerator, which created to, to, to first energy level. There is a small uh, cy cyclic one accelerator again. After that, it brings it here, accelerate one more time. And after that, it goes to the big circle. So it's actually in several <laughs> different uh, uh, iterations actually it reaches the, the big machine. So what people, so what the actually people accelerate? Uh, so you want to go in circles because you want to accelerate for quite a while. If it will be a linear accelerator, then it will be too super long to achieve necessary, uh, necessary, necessary energies. That's why people do it in circles. So it can go many times until it's accelerated. Uh, so you want the particle inside at the stable. It should be charged because the only way to make it in circle to put it in magnetic field. Do you remember this device here put magnet to, to, to bend it? So they actually also put a magnet to bend particles here, right? Uh, and then uh, this also problem seen for photon radiation. Every time you expand it, it should not lose too much energy. Well, electron, so it should be charged, stable, uh, and uh, do not lose much energy by synchroton radiation, which makes, say, we are going to use proton. So they are going to accelerate proton. Uh, so uh, they accelerate it to very high speeds. And let us just uh, recall to which, uh, to which energy they have been accelerated. This is definition of electron volt is energy of electron that passes potential one volt. So uh, uh, injected proton to the big circle is uh, 450 giga electron volt. It's already a lot and this is its speed. So it's almost speed of light. So first five digits is uh, nines and then it becomes not nines, but it's still not enough to get Higgs. They still accelerated to that many nines of speed of light. Uh, so it looks like almost nothing, but because of Lorentz contraction, this is a huge difference in energy. So this is uh, total energy. So like on, on, I think it's uh, when two particles collide. This is, uh, uh, in, it's not one proton, but two of them collide, as I remember. It's seven teleelectron tele volt. So it's 1,000 times higher energy. Uh, that is achieved needed for this acceleration. So is it a, is it a lot? So uh, if if I just take uh, this keyboard and try it here, I will spend much 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 more energy uh, than uh, energy consisted in, in in one proton moving at this almost bit of light speed. Uh, actually, one battery can charge millions of protons in theory up to these energies. The trick is that you want to channel all this energy to one given particle. Whereas uh, statistical physics says that you cannot uh, force uh, to be all energy to one place. It always will be distributed because of chaos. And in reality, you'll have a lot of protons because also you want to have luminosity in your accelerator, you have many protons. And now it's come more serious. Uh, actually, if you multiply number of protons, each proton has, for particles, a huge energy, but it's less than energy of mosquito. Well, mosquito is millions, I mean, terms of 20 particles or even more. Uh, so if you multiply number of protons, but actually uh, proton energy by number of protons, so the total energy here is, uh, okay, this is what I suggested, 400 ton train at 150 kilometer per hour. So this, all this energy of a train is concentrated in the proton beam of accelerator. And when this happens, that's what I told you, when, when, when actually LHC is running, it's one third, not of Geneva, but of Geneva Canton, which is like a region, not on, only the city. 
Okay, so this is how energetic is thing. So it runs here. There are actually several detectors, at least CMS, LHCB, and Atlas. And I don't remember uh, if I were experimentalist, I would know it for sure, but uh, it's I know that not only one detector, but several different ones here in Higgs boson. But uh, here is a picture for CMS. <laughs> so here, collision happens. So two proton beams collide. When they collide at very high energy, they create a lot of particles. And, uh, and there are many detectors. This whole type of uh, this photomultipliers and uh, Wilson chambers and whatever they also use. Uh, this is modern version of everything I told you, showed you before on like in historical scale. So they will register photons, electrons. I mean, most of the things will be photons, electrons, neons, neutrons. All, so this will be like 99% of things will go out. But they want very special events. So very many events happening. This is this picture. This is what I what I told before. Actually, you need one petabyte of data uh, coming. You just need to filter it out. And this is actually the process in which Higgs boson participate. So you have proton, which consists of three quarks. One quark emits gluon. Uh, the exchange, I suppose, is a quark, uh, produces Higgs boson, and then uh, is decays in, 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 into photons. It, there are two channels of decay, also through W bosons, which uh, this um, massive um, particles uh, uh, explaining the decay of neutron. And so these two things, uh, it's a main channel of the decay of Higgs. And so this is uh, what you see. And this bump, discovery of this bump, uh, was discovery of, of Higgs boson. When you subtract this curve, you, you get more, much more clear bump. So here it's 125 peak, and this is a peak of, of, uh, of Higgs boson. So what is actually this energy is energy of these two gamma quants. Uh, uh, it's, it's just gamma radiation just to photons. The combined energy is 125 GeV, and this means that they were obtained from the de uh, destruction of one Higgs boson. So Higgs produce one in a billion 13th electron volt collision. So I said it's seven is boss. No, it's only one direction, and this other direction together is 13. Okay. So Higgs produced one in a billion and one in 500 can be detected, <laughs> but well, people did it. And so they confirm a standard model. Uh, so let, let's make a summary. So uh, until electrons was nice, uh, uh, but when we split electrons and nucleons, we need quantum mechanics to explain uh, uh, how atoms are made. Then what we learned now that uh, nucleus consists of protons and neutrons, uh, to describe this, we already need quantum field theory. Uh, and proton neutrons consist of three quarks. And uh, to do this, we need to introduce a new type of quantum field theory, which is called quantum chromodynamics. Uh, so quarks are matter on this in the theory, and gluons, there are eight of them, uh, 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 replacing photons. Uh, so they have issue of confinement. So proton con consists of three quarks, but we cannot take them apart. And moreover, we have many particles that require other quarks. So early, early experiments had this um, uh, strange quark, uh, but also there are three other quarks and total the uh, three generations. And uh, there was another problem that uh, uh, this problem of uh, the decay of natron should have been explained. And to explain it, uh, people have to introduce a uh, Higgs mechanism to, uh, to explain everything together. And so compared together, we have standard model. So, uh, so now that's how we understand nature, uh, like on the elementary scales. We have fermions. Uh, so we have um, heavy part of fermions, which are quarks. We have three generations, up and down. Uh, making normal matter, but there is also this charm and strange top and bottom. That is much more heavier. You see, this is uh, their masses. 
uh, so it's like thousand times more, hundred times more on top. Uh, and there are also light uh, uh, fermions, massive uh, uh, electron and their other generation partners. And there is also these guys. Uh, well, in, in canonical standard models, they're massless, but people discovered uh, neutrino oscillations and now we know they are not. And this actually seems to say that this, this what we've here already is incomplete and it should be updated. So, but, so, but like at least in a, in, they are massless in very good approximation. Uh, and this is what constitutes matter uh, of, uh, of everything what we see. Uh, and this matter interacts through bosons. And so the most known to us is photon. It's electromagnetic radiation. There are eight gluons, which uh, strong force, strong force, it's interaction between quarks that keeps them together, but also it actually keeps neutron and proton together in the nucleus. We actually never discuss this part, why they do not fall apart. Actually uh, interaction of neutron and proton is like Van der Waals interaction on the level of, of, of elementary particles. Using again, eventually gluons. So effectively gluons combine together to form this, uh, well, uh, well, okay, uh, well, this probably, okay. Then, um, and finally we have a weak force which explain decay of neutron. And originally there were three guys, uh, but Higgs broke the symmetry and there were two guys which called W boson and one guy who is called Z boson. They have different masses. Now, originally there were three of the same, uh, three of the same mass equal to zero, but Higgs mechanism makes them massive and short interact, uh, in short, short lived interaction. And to, to make all this thing renormalizable and explain many symmetries present, we needed Higgs and it was discovered. So this looks happy end, but there are loose ends. And where there are loose ends, new physics starts. And uh, in two weeks, uh, so one loose ends ends in gravity, which we discuss next week, and another looks and ends also in gravity, but for, in different sense. If you, so loose ends is going to be discussed in two weeks. Uh, what's beyond this, and uh, uh, what people are looking for these days. So this explains why people did build LHC to like, well, there are many other reasons, not only this, but this is the one which is easy to, well, like easier than other to explain. Uh, and now I want to come to the question of budget uh, because we say that 1 billion per year is a lot, but in reality is compatible with the budget of Real Madrid, Madrid football club. Uh, so let's let's make it again. So uh, scientific experiment we can explain uh, the nature of the most fundamental scales is worth for humanity as much as one football club per year. Uh, and moreover, humanity spends almost thousand times more for defending against each other, whereas science offers much better ways. So, I mean, waters defend against each other. It's, it's fight for resources eventually, or who will be in control. Science offer much better ways to use resources. It gives us orders of magnitudes better ways to use what we have. Yet we spend most of the money to defend against another instead of investing to improve everybody's uh, uh, well, wealth, basically. And well, if you look, look at these numbers, I, I found it's, let's say, how it's modern. Well, you may think for yourself. Uh, this accomplishes my lecture. And uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, for everybody who helped me today uh, to prepare it. Uh, so this, I want to say about this picture. Uh, so this actually, pixel art picture, and these are small ants who are, who are building observatory. So there are many people who helped me to create these slides. So thank you to all of them. And likewise, thousands of people were building LHC to achieve uh, the feat uh, that we have today. 
And the last thing, uh, there was a reason behind this lecture we aim to raise funds. Uh, so please consider doing this and uh, look at our website. We have information about this. Well, thank you. No good time for questions. Well, to make it short, this means that at least two of them have mass. So you have to update this model. Uh, so one of the proposal is that the some outside of this table, there is a force, uh, very, very heavy neutrino or something like this. And it's slightly mixed uh, with these three guys, which make this light mixture, uh, it's massive. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, we need to make small update of the table. Uh, I suppose people write articles about this, but there is no like standard uh, thing about this yet. Uh, otherwise, we will know it about it, because, uh, but we don't. So. I would suggest a homework exercise. Given this number of quarks, try to calculate the number of baryons which you can make out of them and check how many baryons have not been discovered yet. So, Yeah, there are no questions. Oh. Um, I wonder actually. <laughs> Before I forgot, uh, I can switch on machine if you want to look uh, electron emission. I did not notice that it's already very late. Last time I was looked at the clock was still before eight. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, we have raised hands in in Zoom, but I don't know how to how to make Zoom participants speak now. Mm -hmm. No, let me try. Well, okay, I guess this is a, somehow it doesn't work. Yeah, so thank you, Dima. And, uh, so see you next week for general activity.